Hi everyone, this is Jeff Suda with the Steel Utility Pole Coalition and you are attending the Stay at Home series, a, six, a free six part webinar series on how to build a better distribution and sub transmission system using steel utility poles. Uh, today's presentation is Durability Solutions and Inspection of Steel Poles presented by Thomas Langill of the American Galvanized Association, Gino Sinkovich of Sherwin-Williams and Taylor Lewis of Sherwin-Williams. Uh, before we get started, I wanna go through some housekeeping things and then also we're having a few technical difficulties with one of the presenters uh, mics so we're going to change up the order a little bit but we should get that solved and get moving along if you're having issues with your audio or would like to join audio via phone the dial in is at the bottom of the screen and i'll go ahead and put that in the chat function below as well And then if you are having any issues, sometimes VPNs can cause problems. So you may want to look into turning off your VPN. And then throughout this presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat function at the bottom right hand corner of this. As I had mentioned, you're attending the stay at home webinar series. Um, so for future, or this webinar series is held every Thursday from 11 till noon Eastern time. Uh, future topics we have are for next week, May 21st, we'll go over uh, case studies of what has worked for other users. And then on May 28th, we'll finish out the webinar series with a Q&A series, uh, going over all the questions asked during this series, as well as uh, open this up for discussion with the audience. Before we get into today's presentation, I wanted to introduce the Steel Utility Coal Coalition and give everybody a little bit more idea of who we are. The Steel Utility Pole Coalition is a coalition of industry groups, manufacturers, and end users whose goal is to promote, the steel, or promote steel poles for use in sub-transmission and distribution through education, research, and marketing. Really, this group was formed because we realized there wasn't the education tools or linemen were not familiar with working with steel poles as they, you know, we'd hope, as well as there was some misinformation or not as much knowledge in the industry of steel poles. Since there are three different presenters today, I wanted to give everybody an overview of what today's agenda will be. So uh, we were gonna start with a, an overview of hot dip galvanizing by Dr. Tom. Uh, we are having some issues, so we're shuffling this around where we're going to start with duplex systems and coding technology by Gino Sinkovich. And then we will move on to field repairs and asset life extension by Taylor Lewis. And hopefully by then, uh, we will have the issue figured out and we'll get back to the hot dip galvanizing by Dr. Tom. Um, so we're going to go ahead and um, get on with uh, Gino's presentation. So introducing Gino, Gino Sinkovich, um, having a lifelong passion for understanding all things technical, Gino's career path into coatings industries has been a natural fit. With respect to protecting steel utility structures, he has been closely involved with the industry starting back in 2004. Over this time and working closely with several industry leaders, he has been a part of an evolution in the industry that has seen tremendous improvement in both, in both application and quality finishing products performance. These improvements have helped the industry deliver the best performing coating protection systems for steel utility structures than ever before. And he looks forward to continuing to, to support the industry as they push for even better long-term asset protection. All right, Taylor, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen, um, go ahead. Or do you... Okay, Jeff, uh, are you are you able to see that screen? Hello. Yep, I I am able to see it because everyone else see it as well. Okay, perfect. Um, so just uh, just give me a quick moment here, folks, and 
I'm just queuing up one other item. Gotta love technology. For the amount of time that we spend on it lately, you would think we'd have all this, <laughs> all this figured out. So, okay, I am, uh, I am ready to go here. So, Jeff, are we good to go from your side, from what you can see? So, for me, it looks like your audio is flickering, or your screen is flickering, and then it looks like someone else's as well. Um, so, I'm actually going to switch it to uh, the presenting mode, where unfortunately your graphics won't come across, but it doesn't look like it's working the other way. So I apologize for that. Okay. Um, let me just give me one more uh, moment here. Okay. So we're getting a lot of flicker is, is what we're getting. Yeah. So I just moved it to the, um, the backup version that doesn't have the animations in it. Okay, that's going to cover up some of the content, but we'll do the, the best job that we can. Okay, so I am going to... Okay, so you're going to... I've, I've lost you here. Okay, there we go. So do you... Uh, can I change the slides this in this format, or do you, do you do that now on my behalf? Yeah, click on the right-hand screen or use the arrows. Okay. All right. Well, that was a little clunky, everyone, but I wish to uh, want to extend a uh, thanks to uh, to Jeff and the Steel uh, Pole Utility Coalition for allowing us to participate in the webinar series. Um, I also wish to thank everyone on the call for taking the time uh, to join us. So as far as, let me see here, who I am. Um, Jeff has touched on that. I've been in the codings industry uh, uh, since 2004, and uh, dating back uh, to that time, uh, I immediately jumped into you, the utility poles and the utility structure. So I've been around it for quite some time. I'm currently a business development manager uh, for Sherwin Williams. I've worked for several coding companies, but I've been a part of two acquisitions in the last uh, uh, four years. So I'm happy to say that I've managed to, <laughs> to to stay the course and stay in the industry. So that's who I am. Um, as I said, uh, some of the, you just heard some of these animations uh, uh, won't work in this format, but I did want to, before we got into the actual presentation, acknowledge uh, all our healthcare uh, uh, workers uh, everywhere. Um, I mean, certainly these are unprecedented times for uh, for all of us and you know, we're all trying to do business as usual as best we can, but it's really anything but. Uh, so thank you for, for, for all of the, the hard work that's being done by, by the healthcare professionals uh, around, the, around the earth. So today's agenda, um, I'm just going to spend just a little bit of time explaining uh, who we are as Sherwin-Williams and uh, the markets that to serve as best as possible and then we're going to touch on the coatings and uh, the corrosion aspects as they relate to you know to, to steel in general but um, also to the utility pools uh, for sure so about who we are uh, we're very big we're a very big company we're actually the largest coding company in the world um, we have a, a very much a global footprint over 60,000 employees this next slide shows that um, we are, how we're sort of uh, deployed globally. We have a very big stores network of over 4,600 stores around the world with 4,000 of those store locations being in uh, North America. And we have more than 140 manufacturing and distribution facilities. So that means that we can get the products that are needed uh, to pretty much any corner uh, fairly quickly. Uh, the way Sherwin-Williams operates, uh, I, I just finished explaining that we are very big. Uh, generally speaking, I'm not a big fan of big. Um, I like small because small means focus, uh, lots of attention, uh, lots of specialization. So despite our size, uh, as Sherwin-Williams, we do operate by market segments. Um, I am focused uh, primarily on the, uh, the utility, the power and utility 
And I also had some responsibility in the water wastewater because of the technologies that I support, they cross over into those areas. So protecting assets is what we do. Uh, steel is steel. Um, we protect concrete as well. We protect iron as well. So steel, iron, and concrete is what we do. Um, but we do it in a lot of different places. The reason I'm just bringing this up is, is that a lot of times when, when one industry starts to do something new that it hasn't done before, um, it isn't revolutionary or trailblazing. It's simply a, a technology transfer. So this is a benefit of being... Uh, being who we are and serving across multiple markets, a lot of times when a new challenge or, or, or even an old problem needs to be solved, we can draw on a variety of different applications to, uh, to find the best solution. So I was supposed to present after Tom, and I am a big fan of galvanizing. Uh, it is a very much uh, a proven coating technology. It is a coating. A lot of some people don't know that, but uh, gal galvanizing is a coating. Um, and it uh, it certainly is one of the, I would say, one of the most robust uh, coating systems you'll find anywhere. Um, so the question is, why would we want to put another coating over galvanizing? Um, and it's a fair question. This is, uh, this is a big part of the reason why is uh, as capable and as potent as galvanizing is, um, it does have a few weak spots. Uh, it's certainly uh, in atmospheric uh, service, um, it, it does what it's supposed to do. Tom will certainly probably explain this a lot better, uh, but it goes from being a, a shiny, newly galvanized zinc covered uh, substrate it, and with various degrees in, of exposure and time, it, it goes through many cycles and forms different um, patina layers. And ultimately after you know a year or 18 months, it depends, it forms, in most cases, a, a, a patina layer that does a, uh, it's almost impenetrable. Uh, but in certain conditions, like where you have, uh, you know, in these pictures here, you can, you can be out in uh, marshy areas, a lot of pollution, um, and you can just have different uh, soil conditions that can all contribute to uh, a rapid, rapid, uh, um, I guess, uh, uh, you know, it chews through the zinc and then you have real big problems because your underlying steel gets exposed, which we don't want to see happen. Uh, pernace, uh, corrosion, is the deterioration of a substance, usually metal, or its properties because of a reaction with environment. I think the slide just prior to that did a pretty good job of showing that. I mean, that takes a tremendous amount of energy to create steel. Uh, we take all the raw materials, uh, the different ores and the different alloys, and elements and, and put a tremendous amount of energy uh, to create that steel. And the moment that it is created, it kind of wants to release that energy right away, but slowly and go back into its raw states. So that is what we are battling against. This is just a simple snapshot of a, of, of a corrosion circuit and corrosion in its simplest forms is, is very much an electrical circuit. You have a anode, a cathode, a metallic pathway, and then an electrolyte. So under many conditions, and even just raw steel sitting outside um, and just, just sitting in the backyard, uh, it will start to corrode very quickly. So when we're looking at how do we stop this, this is, um, this is one, of the, uh, one of the sort of flow charts that we use to figure it out. So this is more applicable to the uh, utility structures, as most of you probably already know. Um, on the right hand side, we have our material selection. Uh, I mean, there are many instances where um, for a given project and in a given service uh, environment, uh, thicker steel will be uh, specified simply to allow for more time to, uh, to pass before it, the corrosion gets to a point where it compromises the integrity of the, of the particular structure. The problem with that is, is that it costs more um, it certainly adds to the weight of the structure, which you know, you're transporting it to all corners. So not necessarily the most cost effective or reliable way to do that. So then that takes us over to the left hand side is the use of coatings. Um, on the right hand branch is the sacrificial coatings. Uh, that's in this very much hot dip galvanizing falls into that category. Um, so 
the zinc that gets applied uh, when it through hot dip galvanizing, we'll focus on that one. Um, when it gets applied properly, it uh, it creates a variety of different alloy levels in the steel. So the steel still exists, but those top layers uh, become a mix of, of steel and zinc. And then the outer layers be, are, are 100% zinc. And the zinc rea is far more reactive uh, than is the steel. So then that's when it starts to corrode and form those patina layers. So its job is to protect the, um, the steel by, by sacrificing itself. Uh, the wonderful thing about the galvanizing process is that in most instances, that patina layer that is formed um, is so well adhered to, this, to, to the underlying zinc that the corrosion essentially stops, which is why you can get 40, 50, 60, 70 year uh, design life out of uh, galvanizing systems. Um, I just lost my screen here. Okay, here we go. So on the uh, left-hand branch, we have the bonded coatings, and that's where that's where uh, Sherwin Williams fits in. Uh, these are uh, primarily uh, polymer coatings. Uh, the the big chemistries that you, most of the people will be familiar with are polyurethanes and epoxies, and uh, both liquids and and powders. And um, the, so these can be used independently. So you can uh, uh, certainly just put a coating or a coating system onto steel, or you can actually apply a coating over top of the galvanizing, which creates <coughs> our du duplex system. So this was one of my fancy animation slides, which uh, was gonna walk you through all this, but uh, what we can't see here is um, in the middle section. Uh, so for in most cases, you can just put um, a galvanized steel directly into the ground. Uh, you do have to have your geological information in order. Um, you know, many soils, uh, standard brown soils and sandy soils, uh, generally speaking, if there's uh, no other factors involved like water tables and uh, some chloride situation in place, you, um, you're good to go with a direct embed, but and that's often not the case. Just in the United States alone, um, I've seen uh, several geological maps showing all the there, there's just dozens and dozens of uh, of different uh, uh, types of soils and and uh, and then you start to cross fill the the chloride contents the water table the pH and the resistivity of the soil and you can have literally hundreds upon hundreds of different conditions uh, that will uh, rapidly um, deteriorate the galvanizing alone so that's when you look to put a polymer coating over top of that galvanizing layer. I did also want to mention here that uh, these duplex systems are also used for atmospheric service, uh, both to extend the life cycle. A lot of times you'll see um, galvanized steel bridges uh, receive a top coating because it does extend uh, the, the life cycle a little bit. I'll, I'll touch on that um, in a later slide. Uh, but it also can be done for aesthetic reasons if, if if a, if a city has a certain theme or, or color, you know, for the street lights, for example, you'll, you'll also put a coating over the galvanizing to, to get long service life and the right aesthetic look. So in our case with the utility poles, uh, you have your, your protection system is, you know, galvanizing truly can be uh, both a cathodic, that's sacrificial, that's what most people think, but uh, like when those botania layers form, um, it does form a, a barrier to break and interrupt that, uh, that corrosion cycle. Uh, but in, in many cases, when it's in the ground, you do not get to that protective, uh, that protective state of the patina. And the zinc gets corroded extremely quickly. And then it gets to the underlying steel. And that dramatically shortens the service life of, of the structure. Uh, that's where the polymer coating comes in. The polymer, uh, I mean, there are zinc-rich uh, products and primers that technically are cathodic systems, but in the context of what's happened with the utility structures, uh, you know, you have, the, it doesn't really make sense to put a zinc, a zinc primer over a galvanized structure that there's, <laughs> there's all the zinc's already in place. So in this context, we're talking about barrier protection. And uh, the barrier protection simply stops or greatly reduces the ability of uh, the electrolyte to get in contact with the steel so that corrosion cell and circuit uh, cannot form. 
So the coating, the polymer coating, protects the zinc, which preserves it. And then with the passage of time, depending on what the surface conditions are, and you can see in the image here to the, uh, to the right, that you do have a portion of the coated pole um, protruding from the mic just cut out um, so we're not able to hear you right now hello all right I can hear you again can you hear me okay apologies for that I don't know where I cut out um, so I would we're talking uh, last I heard uh, the last service coatings and don't really have much before that. So uh, did I make it to the polymer coatings part? When Th you heard that's me? right where you were at. Okay. So um, again, just to uh, pardon me if I double up here, but uh, the polymer coating basically um, its job in this context of the utility poles is to protect the underlying zinc uh, from uh, some of those forces that would uh, cause that accelerated corrosion. Um, so it's uh, it's a proven system. It's been uh, it's been tested and validated for more than three decades, and it works. Um, and my bottom uh, note here on the synergistic effect, uh, uh, you do if you if you do get um, if you in any given service uh, environment, just for simple math, let's just say your galvanizing alone would give you a fifty year uh, design life. And your polymer coating would give you alone would give you um, let's say a 25 year design life at, at your thinner mill like 20 mils something like that. Um, if you put the 25 year coating or 30 year coating on top of the 50 year zinc coating, um, you end up getting a synergy out of those two, and it exceeds the uh, basically the sum of uh, of the individual uh, design life. So you 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 get in excess of 100 years. Uh, it really depends. There's it, the more you read on this, there's, uh, I'm not a hundred years old, so I can't speak to it from uh, personal experience. Uh, but there is some debate. Uh, you've seen claims up to 125 years. I'm not saying that that's not the case, uh, but I mean, it, there's just so many variables in play. The one thing that is irrefutable is that um, the combination of the galvanizing and the polymer coating. Um, absolutely exceed the uh, the capabilities of those two systems on their own. In the case of uh, where we as Sherwin Williams uh, um, support the industry, uh, we have two product lines and two product brands that have uh, that are very strongly established in the utility market here in North America. One of them being uh, the Coracote brand and the other one being the Polycote brand. Um, I will say that uh, for those of you who may not be aware of the backstory here, you say, well, why would you have two products doing the same thing in the same part of the market? Um, uh, the Coracote uh, product lines came through an acquisition. The Polycote were, um, uh, were developed and marketed by Sherwin-Williams. They are extremely similar products. Uh, they were designed and engineered to do the same thing in the same place, in the same markets. Um, and we just happen to have our, um, our, our, our customer base that uses both of these chemistries. They are essentially the same. Um, and I had a notation here that's not showing up that we uh, will be doing a rebranding uh, this year uh, we're aiming for late Q2, uh, early Q3 uh, to have that completed. So anybody on this call that would want to find out more can just contact me and I can get them that additional information. So when it, so when it comes to coatings, um, I just thought wanted to provide a little bit of a broader uh, uh, piece of information on the coating chemistry itself. Um, we get asked, which is best? We get asked that a lot, what's best? And when it comes to coatings and, and the chemistries itself, um, yeah, my approach is you, it's like tools in a toolbox. Um, you, tools are designed for a very specific pur uh, purpose. 
But you know, sometimes depending on where you're at and what you're doing, uh, one tool will be better than than another at it. Coatings are very much the same way. Now, the resins themselves, whether you're talking about um, epoxies or polyurethanes or alkyds or acrylics or whatever, you, or, or powder coatings, fusion bonded uh, epoxy powders, the resins really give the coating its true personality and characteristics. Um, what what will vary is how you apply it. You know, if your powder coatings, for example, they need a lot of uh, infrastructure, they need a lot of equipment and dedicated lines. So you certainly, it's very difficult to apply powder coatings in the field. Um, and also considerations like um, cure time, um, all of those factors. I don't wanna take up too much time diving through this part. But I will say that in this uh, presentation, you'll be able to keep a copy of it. Um, and, and this sort of gives an overview on, on, on the epoxies. Epo everyone's familiar with epoxies. Tremendous range in chemistry. Uh, just really, really uh, potent performance. Uh, but in the case of the utility structures, epoxies tend to take, uh, take longer to cure. So, I mean, if you're, you know, you have to move these structures in and then move them out. Uh, having to park them somewhere for two, three, four hours or eight hours, depending on which chemistry you use, is not very uh, is not ideal. Especially a lot of these products are staged outside once they're coated, so you you have um, considerations for rain and, and and weather and on dust and all kinds of all kinds of other factors, which is why epoxy is really not used. The polyurethanes, there's two big uh, product families here, uh, aliphatic and aromatic. What's important to know is that for the utility structures, for the, for the polyurethanes that are providing the barrier protection, we are talking about aromatic chemistry. Aliphatics, are, uh, are, they go on much thinner uh, film builds, and they're really designed for UV protection and aesthetics. It's, it's something that um, anyone on the call that wants to understand better can contact me directly. Uh, but for uh, the, the protection of these utility poles that we've seen and covered so far, we're talking about aromatic uh, polyurethanes. And one of the, they, they have tremendous barrier properties. They provide a lot of protection to, to the zinc and the steel itself, um, high abrasion resistance. Um, however, one of their, the, the key elements of this particular polyurethane is that you can handle these poles in, you know, in a, after five to 10 minutes, depending on the temperature and the set time of the product. So, um, the big, big appeal to the pole manufacturers is that they can put on a high performance coating and they don't have to sit around for hours waiting to move it out of, out of the staging area. Uh, again, uh, these uh, acrylic resins, alkids, they've been around for a long time. Um, they're generally not, they, they do not really perform as, uh, as well as the polyurethanes and epoxies, but uh, sometimes, you know, if you're doing field repairs or you're doing uh, something that doesn't require a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of performance, uh, these technologies can make sense as well. And as I move towards the end of my portion here, I'm sorry for time, I think I'm okay. Um, understanding the entire situation, when, when, when you're talking about what coding do I need, uh, there can be a lot of variables. A manufacturer who's building new structures and they have their facilities set up, that, that creates one set of needs. But if you're going out into the field, into remote locations, uh, doing what, what the manufacturer did uh, may not be feasible. So we have to look at alternative systems and you know, even equipment. Well, what equipment can I get out to, to the site? Uh, what are my, uh, my, when do I need to be in and out of there? All kinds of things. So uh, just walking through the entire, uh, I have to coat this, this is, these are the conditions that I need to, to do it in. What are my options? So just thinking through all of those is really important and that will always lead you to the best choice of, of your coding. And one uh, closing note here is uh, even the best coding chemistry in the world will not do its job if it's not applied properly. Um, in in this, these two photos, these you can see here in both of them, if, if you look closely at substrate, you can still see that spangle pattern of the galvanizing. Uh, these are high solids polyurethanes. They don't contain any solvents, so they, require, uh, they rely entirely on a mechanical bond to the substrate. 
Um, so if diligent uh, surface preparation is not followed, uh, they simply just can't hold on to that zinc and then it causes additional problems. This is something Taylor will uh, provide much more detail on, I believe, in, in his part of the presentation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we serve, we're market uh, specific and market focused, but within each market, you have a pretty broad range of uh, possibilities. So we've broken it down to uh, the power
solutions available. And hopefully I haven't gone over too much. That's uh, that's my part of the uh, presentation. I'm not sure if any anyone has any questions or if we have time. But Jeff, let me know. Significant work done by Corpro on uh, looking at the behavior of soils and the different types of soils. They looked at things like resistivity and um, some other parameters for the soil and use those as their guide to soil performance. But I found that the, the key elements in looking at the soil rate based on the data that they had presented were the chloride content of the soil, the pH of the soil, and the moisture. And so well, what I did is put some charts together to give a guide to soil corrosion and where you could expect back to see high levels of corrosion, meaning you'd look for duplex systems or lower levels of corrosion where a direct burial of a galvanized part would be okay. So develop this chart, and this chart's available, these charts are available at our EA website, and what it's showing is that if you have high chlorides, you look at the two charts. If you have low chlorides, you look at the bottom two charts. The first chart at the top is low moisture. So you're below 17.5% moisture. And so all the soil samples that were 